All right, so uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Darren Johnson. I'm the uh, I play Plan Ventura Section Secretary. Uh, thanks for those who've joined us. A um, couple of quick announcements. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Ultimately Foundation, which was uh, the impetus for this series of talks. Um, our section received a grant uh, to promote uh, engineering resilience in drought and wildfires and uh, sustainable engineering in, in general. Um, our next talk in the series will be on August 25th, 25th with uh, Dr. Joan Dudley of UC Davis. She will be discussing uh, disentangling what changes our forests. Also, uh, coming up in October is our annual STEM event in Thousand Oaks, um, annual except for last year. Uh, planning's underway now, and uh, we still have a few slots for volunteers. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, check out our website, or um, if you reply to the WebEx email that you received, uh, it'll end up uh, going to the right place anyway. Uh, there will be a QA. and uh, You should be able to find the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the WebEx uh, window. Uh, let's see, if, uh, if you ask you who do you want to send the question to, go ahead and select all panelists. Um, I'll be uh, arranging those. And, uh, if it's a WebEx question, I'll answer it. If it's uh, something for the speaker, I'll be arranging those for the speaker. Uh, at that point, I'd like to turn this over to Jerry Knotts. Uh, Jerry is a longtime uh, IEEE volunteer and is chair of our uh, Life Member Affiliate Group. So, uh, Jerry? Yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, Jerry yeah. Knotts here. Anyway, uh, we are so fortunate tonight because <clears throat> not only do I have a, a dear friend, uh, Brian Allen, speaking since he and I have known each other since 1985. That we met through his father. <laughs> anyway, all these airline pilots, but through uh, the activities of an international guard out there, the 146. And uh, when you see this presentation tonight, keep one thing in mind: there isn't a thing that he's going to talk about that don't have his fingerprints all over it, because he started very early. And uh, he built stuff for the National Guard that they haven't seen around the rest of the country, namely <laughs> a new command post and everything else. And I could toot his horn forever, but I'm not going to take any more of his time. Ryan, you got it. Well, thanks, Jerry. Uh, and thank you all for having me. I, I'm sure, honored to be here. Uh, before we begin, uh, sure. Muhammad actually did have something he wanted to, to talk about. So, Muhammad, you should be able to unmute now. Sorry about oh, that. Can you hear me? Ah uh, yes. Oh okay. <laughs> uh, I've been struggling with this. Well, I, I uh, on behalf of the aerospace chapter, um, I want to welcome Colonel Allen, and uh, looking forward to uh, his talk. Thanks. Thank you. I'm I'm glad to be here. Um, Jerry invited me to give you a, a speak on uh, the MAFS system, so. I drug out some of my old PowerPoint uh, presentations that I've given to uh, everybody from the office of, office of Secretary of Defense down to uh, local politicians, and so dusted some of the things off, and and uh, hopefully it'll be entertaining. Um, with that, let me uh, start the. If we can get this to work. So this button. There is the presentation in, in view. Yeah. 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 Looks good. Looks good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is me. I'm retired. I'm a, a United States Air Force Colonel. I, I was the former 146th Operations Group Commander uh, here at the 146th Airlift Wing. The 146th Airlift Wing is a C-130 Air National Guard unit that's positioned right next to Point Magoo Naval Air Station here in Southern California. Now we have our own Air National Guard base with a taxiway to the Navy's runway. And on that installation, we have eight C-130J model aircraft uh, that we've had. The base was uh, built in 1989 with the help of Jerry, in fact, um, working through all the political work. And um, we were able to um, to move the air, the wing that was once in in Van Nuys over to 
this new base that we've built. It is now uh, one of the premier uh, tactical airlift wings in the United States Air Force. It's one of four wings that do the aerial firefighting mission set, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, in addition to um, my command, uh, I've been with that wing or had been with that wing for a little over 30 years. I retired just, uh, just over two years ago. And I joined the unit in 1989 when it was moving from Van Nuys over to, to Channel Islands. And I, I joined as enlisted and I wanted to become a pilot. And so I eventually was able to become a pilot at the, at the wing and um, flew C-130E models and then C-130J models. In 1994, I was able to progress to the point that I could be a co-pilot in the aerial firefighting mission set. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but how complicated it is to become a aircrew member in the aerial firefighting system. Uh, in, 19, in 2003, um, not only did we deploy to the Middle East, uh, I also became the uh, California State Program Manager for the, for the MAFS system, the firefighting system. That led me into being, eventually into being the Air National Guard subject matter expert in fixed wing aerial firefighting for the entire country. And I had a counterpart in the Air Force Reserve Command at Colorado Springs. He and I basically uh, molded the program into what it is today. So that's kind of a little bit of a background for me. Um, rewind just a bit. Uh, back when I was a Boy Scout, um, I lived in the forest. I loved the forest. I, I uh, became an Eagle Scout at 13 years old, and I just loved being in the forest. My original plan for the future was to be a U.S. Forest Service Ranger. Well, in high school, uh, in Newberry Park High School, Mr. Mutolo in the math class introduced me to a computer system called a Wayne 2200. Uh, and then I fell in love with automation. So I became a software engineer and then a hardware integrator. And in, uh, when I turned 25 years old, I realized that was gonna kill me. And I needed to fly because my, my family, my dad flew, my, bro my brothers flew and it was in the blood. When I would go flying, it just seemed right. So in culmination, becoming an aerial firefighting pilot I, and being in, employed with creating the program and making sure the equipment works, I hit, I've hit every single autumn item. I've become in, I've flown, I haven't been walking in the forest, but I've been flying over 150 feet. I've built these systems, helped build these systems that we do using aerial firefighting, and there's a lot of automation and tinkering with those. And then as a pilot, of course, I get to fly over. That's, so that's really my treat. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the history of, of MAFs. I'm gonna talk about the, the, the system itself, uh, give you an overview of how it works, how it's built, put together. We're going to talk about employment. And by employment, I mean what it takes to get onto a fire and actually uh, dispense retardant on the fire. Operations is actually the mechanical process of flying. How do we get, uh, once we get the retardant on the airplane, how do we get out and, and uh, fleet, fly behind a, a lead plane? What altitudes and airspeeds and things like that will do and, and uh, actually drop, execute? Uh, and then at the end, I'll have a uh, dis short discussion on some of the retardants we use, uh, and we'll have a Q&A after that. I do have some really interesting videos to share. There's two that are built into the presentation and then several others that I've shot uh, myself using a GoPro camera, which is a whole different uh, uh, thing that, that came up in 2013. Um, they wanted me to have bring back some video, and you'll, I'll, I'll explain why when we get to those videos. So hopefully we'll have time for those. Back in uh, 1971, um, back in the 1970s, there was a fire in Santa Barbara that uh, burned, and it burned a lot of houses, a lot of the high-value houses. And uh, the question was, is we have all these Air Force aircraft, why can't they help? So a prototype was built, was designed and built using a C-123 uh, aerial spray system. C-123 is a cargo kind of aircraft. And these, as you can see, these tanks were designed to be built inside that aircraft, and they used that model uh, from the uh, company FMC uh, to as as a starting point for what they would thought could be used to dispense retardant over fires. Now, remember, back in this time frame, there were air tankers, but those air tankers were typically smaller uh, single-engine air tankers that were T6s that were. Reef refitted with tanks on the bottom of them or um, 
B-25s or some of the old uh, hardware from uh, World War II and the Korean War uh, that were refitted and modified to be able to do some aer aer aerial firefighting. And the, the, so that, would be, that was basically the civilian air tanker fleet. So they figured that they had all these C-130s they could use. Why couldn't we equip them with aerial firefighting capability? So that's why we built this system. And on, on this slide, you'll see that they used a flatbed trailer and they mounted these tanks that were part of the original spray system of the, of the 123. And they, they put these 18 inch ducts on the side. And in this area here, they did two 90 degree elbows to get it out the paratroop doors on the C-130 uh, B model at the time. And then the E model. Uh, the system, when they tried it out, it actually worked pretty good. Uh, it was able to dispense uh, all of that retardant through those two nozzles with enough force to get it down on the ground. So they said, hey, this is a pretty neat idea. So they kept on the design, and by 1971, they were, uh, 1973, they finished the production. And you'll see in this 1973 photograph that the nozzles are actually coming out the cargo ramp. So in this system, the cargo ramp is lowered, and these nozzles um, lower over the back of the ramp and into the slipstream. Um, these systems were completely air powered. There was a battery that ran the little, uh, the electronics, the actuators, but everything else was powered by um, pneumatic pressure. So there was an air tank under each of the systems and there was, uh, uh, let me go back because I don't have a good slide of the, of the interior of the MAPS-1 system. Each of these, uh, the MAPS-1 system had five modules and each of these, uh, four of the modules had tanks in them. And inside those, uh, just below those tanks was an air pressure sphere. So they were all linked and we would, uh, and I'll show you some pictures later, we would come into the ramp and we would pressurize those air tanks with air and we would load retardant on. And when it came time to do the drop, we would use the air pressure to lower the nozzles down into the slipstream uh, and retract them after we were done and then open these, these large 18 inch butterfly valves to allow the retardant to go out. <clears throat> we would also use that, that air pressure to put a head pressure on top of these tanks. So as when the valves were opened, the air pressure that was remaining in the spheres would be pushed in the top of the uh, fluid on the top of the tanks that would be used to blow it out through the manifold and then out through the 18 inch ducts out through the back. So it came out in a, in a significant force um, and we could get up to coverage level four, which is 100 gallons, I mean, 400 gallons per 100 square feet. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but it's a 10 by 10 square, you, you know, you can put um, <clears throat> four gallons per 100 square feet. Uh, there were some limitations in that system. A, it was getting old, uh, corrosion was, was uh, ever present, uh, and it couldn't do the coverage levels that the US Forest Service wanted up to coverage level eight. Um, and you, you, when you flew around with the ramp and door open, the aircraft was unpressurized. So it was kind of wearing on the, on the, on the air crew to be able to be dropping at say six or 7,000 feet all day. Uh, it would be a long, very long day. So they, we needed to re redesign the system. Additionally, the aircraft itself, the C-130E model, uh, and therefore, and then the H models, uh, could load the MAPS-1 system, but the newest C-130J system that was coming out, the newer, the newer airplanes, uh, their cargo bay uh, was significantly modified to the point that it, the old MAPS systems could not fit into the C-130J. So as the uh, Congressman Gallagher led the force to get uh, C-130J aircraft into the 146 airlift wing, specifically for aerial firefighting, we needed an aerial firefighting system that would fit into the J model. So. Uh, design began uh, back in, gee, was 2002, 2001, I think, and it culminated in 2009. And I flew the first uh, operational drop with a new system. The new system, MAPS-2, was designed to carry more retardant to allow the aircraft to be fly around pressurized to get those higher coverage areas up to coverage level eight, eight gallons per 100 square feet. We wanted it to be easier to operate. Uh, most of the operations of the MAPS system itself was conducted by the loadmaster in the back of the aircraft. Uh, and the only thing that was really done up front was a uh, co-pilot pulling a trigger. Uh, we wanted to have a little more capability and we wanted to be able to do different ty types of things 
with the system, not just drop retardant, but maybe drop foams or surfacants and things like that. So we also wanted to be able to have a system to produce its own compressed air on board the aircraft. So we would not have to rely on air compressors on the ground. In other words, we could fly to any air tanker base in the country, load retardant, even if they didn't have one of the ground-based air compressors. So uh, those are some of the design characteristics that we really wanted to have. Furthermore, when we were dropping in the E-model system or the MAPS-1 system over the back of the ramp and door, the airflow back there was not really conducive to stream, a constant stream. So we would lose quite a bit of retardant as, be, as it would be blown up and, and blown up onto the tail of the aircraft coating it. So in the new system, we wanted to make sure that we had less, less waste and uh, be more effective, but we also wanted to have less retardant on the aircraft itself. I'll talk more about retardants later, but one of the reasons we want to do that is because at the time, there were additives in some of the retardants that were corrosive uh, to the metal. That's, they've taken those, those additives out. So the final design came out to be a single nozzle outside the left paratroop door. And as you can see in this picture, there's an orange door plug. They painted it orange because the Forest Service likes orange. And they, they've subsequently, this is one of the uh, initial photographs, they've subsequently put US Forest Service pictures or decals on the sides of it. In this door plug, it allows us to fly pressurized. This, this vent up here is a vent that allows air to come in to replace the, um, the volume of fluid that's dispensed out of the system. So you, don't, uh, so you can actually allow fluid to, to leave the aircraft. This nozzle system, this, this creative design was patented by a company called Aero, Aero Union. And Aero Union actually designed this whole system to the specifications that we wanted. But they came up with this really novel design of this pintle. And this pintle is very much like your garden hose in that this retracts and the fluid goes around the pintle and then joins into a solid stream. And I think I've got a photograph or a video of that. If I don't, I'll cook one up. I think I might have to find one. But it comes into a solid stream and, and it comes out under pressure. You'll see it, there is a video of it. Uh, we can get up to coverage level eight and in some, some areas, some smaller spots, actually up to, up to coverage level 12. Uh, some of the, the issues that we had with this system are, is that because you're pushing out uh, 27,000 pounds of retardant in three to five seconds, it comes out quite, quite fast and under quite uh, enormous pressure. So there's about 13,800 pounds of thrust that comes out that single nozzle. And you'll notice that this nozzle is not in center line. Uh, so we do get a, a moment arm that tracks the nose to the right. So it, it becomes natural as you're flying it when it's happening. You simply add left rudder. But if you don't, it'll track to the left, which is quite interesting. Plus, uh, the thrust that's added forces the aircraft to uh, increase in velocity. And with this particular aircraft, these are free spinning turbines. This, this is an N, basically an N1. It, this is a six-bladed prop, a new engine, new prop on this, on this model of aircraft. These do not go flat and they do not generate uh, drag. So as you increase the thrust, uh, there's no real way to slow down the aircraft other than using flaps. So we're in a margin between stall speed and flap over speed that we've got to be very careful of. So and it even becomes more prominent uh, when you're pointed downhill in a canyon where your gravity is helping you along. The MAPS-2 system is built in, on uh, three main pallets. Uh, the first pallet holds a, a 3,500 gallon tank. Now we, we can fill it up to about 3,000 gallons and I've actually overfilled it to 3,300 gallons inadvertently. And you know, we went out and used it and it's, it works fine. But uh, we limit it to 2,000 to 2,700 gallons and that gives us a, a enough of an air gap in the top to allow the air from the pre these pressurized tanks here to be pressurized and to um, blow down on the system. These little indices here are baffles. Uh, so there's inside this large, huge, large tank, and you'll see some photographs of it later. There are baffles and that's to keep the fluid from uh, moving back and forth rapidly when you're changing attitude of the aircraft. These cylinders here are um, compressed natural, natural gas uh, fuel tanks for buses. Let me see here. Let's talk about the compressor first. These are onboard compressors. Um, these are two large air compressors that can pump up a scuba tank in about 60 seconds. They, they have 
cylinders on these things are about 12 inches in diameter. They take a tremendous amount of power for, for about, five, and this isn't really published, but for less than 500 milliseconds, we get 275 kVA yanked on the aircraft, which exceeds the generator's capacities to be, to be able to, to do, supply the demand. So we, have, we had to build in slip clutches and a resistive soft start system to be able to uh, manage the, the electrical power demand against those four generators that are running. Each of the engines have a large uh, generator. So inside this system, uh, those compressors, when they come on, you, you, it, boy, you watch the electrical system and it scares the hell out of you. Right next to the compressors is a very, is a large cabinet. In that cabinet is computer controls uh, that controls everything. And they're basically microcontrollers, um, pretty uh, imaginative in the day, uh, pretty mundane in today's technology. Uh, but today that remains one of the weak points. Uh, that's it, those, those boards need to be replaced periodically. You can see the single nozzle uh, ducting under here. On the top diagram, you'll see underneath here, there's a single 18 inch duct that, that joins underneath all of these, this large tank and underneath the uh, baffles, there's, there's three, two or three different uh, inlets into this duct. So you can imagine 2,700 gallons of, re of, of retardant floating around in here and a head pressure, uh, good gosh. I'm thinking it's 80 PSI. That's that's digging uh, that we, we we put up there up to 130 psi before the before the these uh, bleed air um, rupture discs go. So I think it's 80 psi we pump in the, in the top of that, and then that that comes from these high pressure tanks. And as we uh, pull the trigger and this this nozzle retracts and the retardant starts to flow, the air continues to flow through high pressure regulators, which are here and here over the top of that to really force that fluid out through the back. This tank is a, is a, is a foam tank or an additive tank. And they've, they've been currently removed, been removed off the systems because they weigh 400 pounds or 800 pounds. <clears throat> and we don't, haven't been using them. Uh, there's, there's controversy over the uh, environmental soundness of dispensing foam over uh, wildland. And although we've tested it in Mexico to, to uh, really great success, we do have to be careful about uh, what we put out into the forest. Uh, retardant itself is significant enough to, um, to be wary of where you're putting it, but foam can be very tricky. Uh, there are other things militarily that we can put into this tank uh, that have been thought of about mass decon, decon, uh, de, um, decon and other things that put in that tank to see if uh, if there's a, a tactical use for it. And some of those things are obviously classified. So there, you can put stuff in this tank, which is currently not on there, but it gets pumped into the flow as it moves out. So the so foam is actually pushed out with it and mixes as it goes and mixes very effectively. So as a foam dispersant system, it, it actually works pretty well. We'll talk about foams when we get to retardants. So this is a, um, a video that I'm gonna show that shows uh, the basic operation of the system inside the aircraft. This is a lead aircraft. <clears throat> this is me flying in, in a training scenario uh, over a, a airfield and we're gonna dispense water. Water is a retardant, but this is a really a demonstration drop. drop. And you can see uh, me positioning, I'm flying this aircraft, me positioning myself behind the lead aircraft and there's some dirty air uh, that I get into. Let's see if this plays. <clears throat> Audio is, is not, there's not much audio in this video. So that, uh, in that you saw I me mean, drop water over um, an airfield and you'll see a picture of that actual water uh, about a 30 minutes later 
20 minutes later after I, I, I land and taxi back. Um, so 2,700 gallons of water were dispensed uh, in about three to five seconds out of that. This is a close up of the nozzle assembly. It's hydraulically actuated. There's hydraulic actuators inside the slipstream. There's a flow uh, director inside. There's, there's veins in here to, to as, as the fluid is going through this S duct, it starts to twist. So we wanted to straighten it out so that uh, it doesn't, it comes out as a, as a steady solid stream out the back and you'll see that in another video. It comes out at about 70 knots aft velocity and again, a 13,800 pounds of thrust. So think of those things as they're applying to the aircraft itself. You take 27,000 pounds of weight off of the airplane, you shoot the airplane with another, another jet engine out the back and it's pushing you at another 70 knots of uh, velocity in your rear end. So as you're going down a hill with in a canyon following a lead plane, it's quite fun. So the MAPS-2 system was built in, and uh, executed in, and first tried out in 2009, December of 2009, and it's been in use since then. Uh, it's self-contained, we can put it in, we actually have gotten to the point where we could put it in in about two hours or less. Uh, the biggest thing is these are these bolts right here on this S duct. Getting those bolts in and, and uh, torqued down correctly takes time. Um, this S duct assembly here, this is the air vent here for bringing air in, and we use that for two two reasons. One is for emergency dump, and the other is to simply replenish the air, uh, uh, relieve the air pressure off the tank when we need to. During the emergency dump, if we don't have any air pressure built up in those tanks or it's gone for some reason, we can still get the return off the aircraft. And that is the large, that's the tank looking aft, and it takes up most of the cargo compartment. Those air compressors generate a tremendous amount of heat as well in the back of that cargo compartment. So that's the MAF system itself. So if, um, uh, how do we get out onto a fire? And, and uh, that's really kind of the money question for a lot of the politicians and for the media is what it, what does it take to get aircraft out onto a fire to, to stop the forward progress of a fire? And in, and can retardant alone stop a fire? And the answer is no. Uh, and there are certain things that, that there are certain processes involved in getting out onto a fire that can be optimized, um, but you'll see some areas why they, they take so much time to get involved. We're gonna talk about the defense support to civil authority mission. We'll talk about the fire request process of how the, the local firefighter, uh, when, he, when the fire starts and it burns out of his control and gets to a point that he can't control it, how he makes requests all the way up to the chain to the national level to get air tankers. Uh, we'll talk about how aircraft are actually dispatched. Um, in every military organization, there has to be a military chain of command. I'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about how the civilian chain of command works and then how the military chain of command interfaces with the civilian chain of command. Uh, that interface is, is a, a novel concept that was produced uh, back in 2003 uh, with the help of General Lifland, the 146 Air, Air, Airlift Wing Commander. Um, and it has been a model for defense support civil authority missions uh, to this day. So what is defense support to civil, civil authority? Well, you just can't take military hardware out and use it in the civilian world without some process. Uh, specifically, you wanna make sure that you're using that military hardware in an appropriate manner. Uh, everything from aerial reconnaissance to weaponry uh, are have very, very, very stringent controls. Many of the other things uh, that are, are available to use, such as uh, aircraft to transport, say, uh, uh, equipment to uh, fix power poles, uh, in a humanitarian mission set, uh, those are a lot easier to use or to get a hold of. And this whole process by which we can use the De Department of Defense equipment and manpower in, in a civil role has been defined and is, is codified in a, in a number of uh, Defense Department instructions and, and, and the regulations. And each different agency has its own little set of regulations and instructions. And I've written most of those. Uh, the idea, though, is to unify the effort of the Air Force, Air National Guard, and Air Force Reserve Command uh, in, the, in the mission set of saving lives and property. In our specific case, we're gonna, we want to use our C-130s as aerial 
air tankers like the civilian fleet. Let's talk about the fire request process. So what happens when there's a fire? Let's say a lightning strike creates a fire. And at that point, the local fireman runs out there with his truck and his hoses, and he tries to put it out. Uh, and he can't, let's say he can't. And at that point, the, the fire is either in terrain that's too big for him to, to use or to get to. Uh, so they call on the county fire department and they, so they, or the borough. So all, all emergencies start at a local level and then they expand into um, districts or counties or boroughs. And in the case here in Ventura County, for example, you'd have Ventura County Fire Department um, dealing with a fire that's, that's say in the uh, back hills of the city of Ventura and it blows out to a point where they now they need assets from the Ventura County, such as a helicopter. They would call through their dispatch mechanism, the county fire department, uh, and they would then bring those, those helicopters. Now, the city of Ventura is responsible for paying for those uh, unless there's a, a, a mutual aid agreement already in place. So now let's say the, the Ventura County brings some helicopters in and the fire now becomes larger than that. All air tankers, except for CAL FIRE's air tankers, are managed at the federal level. CAL FIRE air tankers are managed at the state level. So let's say that they want uh, uh, air tanker support on there. They want to get retardant on that fire, as much retardant as they can in the shortest amount of time. Ventura County, the Office of Emergency Services over here, will, will has a representative in their OES that picks up a phone and makes a call to the uh, OES in state in, in Sacramento. And at that point, they say, yes, you can have type uh, type two type air tankers. You can have some of the S2 tankers that Cal Fire Fleet has. They have 23 uh, S2 tankers, I think, right now. So at that point, the state then comes over. When you initiate from Cal Fire with an S2 tanker, one of, those, one of the smaller air tankers, they are all initial attack qualified. An initial attack means that the, that the individual that's flying that aircraft has the ability to come onto a fire and make an initial assessment and work with the incident commander that's on the ground and dis dispense retardant on their own. So that first S2 that you see that's out there, that first Cal Fire aircraft needs nobody else other than themselves and in contact with the incident commander on the ground to be able to put retardant down. And that's kind of unusual in that all of the other air tankers, all of the larger air tankers, things that air tankers that can carry 3,000 gallons or more all require a lead plane uh, to be to be there on scene so they can be flown in by using a lead plane. And when you get to that point, that all goes federal. So CAL FIRE has the ability to bring small air tankers in very, very rapidly. And those small air tankers can still fly behind lead planes as well. So let's say CAL FIRE comes out with their S2 tankers and they're unable to capture this fire. They make a request to the, it becomes a federal fire <clears throat> at that point, and they make a request. They make a request uh, for help. So that incident commander makes a request to the geographic area coordination center. So the incident commander themselves or their agency for them says, I need help. A geographic area coordination center uh, is, the, the nation is divided into geographic area coordination centers. And California has a north and because it's so big and it has so many fires, they divide California into north and south operations. And so, and there's uh, uh, the, there's a east there's a Great Basin we call them GACs, uh, and they're all over the country. And these GACs they manage the resources within their region. So let's say, let's talk about Southern California, for example. The South Ops, which is down in Riverside, they manage all of the the air tankers that they've they've been assigned uh, within their region. So usually the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise allocates aircraft to a GAC in anticipation of fires or in reaction to fires. So let's say in the Southern California GAC, fire season is progressing, and they think, yeah, I think we're gonna to need to put some heavy air tankers down into Southern California. The NIFC, the National Interagency Fire Center, will allocate, say, two air tankers to Southern California and base them out of San Bernardino. Well, the, Ge the Geographic Area Coordination Center can then give those aircraft to the incident commander. If they become overwhelmed, say South Ops, the, the fire in, in South, the Southern California gets way out of control and need more air tankers, then they, then they coordinate through the National Interagency Coordination Center in 
Boise for additional air tankers. If they run out of civilian air tankers or they can't get civilian air, air tankers quick enough, then they ask the military through a request for assistance to the Department of Defense. There's a, there's a person, we have a, a colonel um, in NIFC at the National Interagency Coordination Center. That 06 colonel, normally an Army guy or gal, is responsible for, for fielding the requests for assistance from the fire agency. And there's an actual document, and it's a, it's a single page, and I've actually created those documents to be handed off. And it says, we need, um, we need air tanker support, and we need them for 30 days, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we agree to pay the bill. And that's the big part there, is that they agree to pay the bill. Once a defense coordinating officer has that piece of paper, their RFA, they submit it to the Joint Directory of Military Support, or JDOMS, which is the Pentagon, and they then task NORTHCOM, which is in Colorado Springs, to produce uh, aircraft. And because it's aircraft, they, they task AF North, which is down at Eglin in Florida, to produce these aircraft. Now, you would think this all takes a lot of time. But uh, through a lot of work, hard work, on yours truly and a couple, several other people, we have this whole process down to uh, literally 30 minutes. And uh, from the RFA to the DCO down through JDOMS and NORTHCOM and AFNORTH, we have what's called a standing DISCA XORD, which in military terms allows us to, re to respond very quickly. The Secretary of Defense has to, author has to authorize military, uh, uh, military assets to be used by the civil agency. In this case, the Secretary of Defense has pre-authorized these eight MAPS aircraft, and it's one of very few assets that are already pre-authorized to be to, as soon as the National Interagency Coordination Center makes a request of the DCO, they are, they are automatically approved. So all of that red tape has been cut, and then all of these documents that have to be filled in are basically boilerplated, and they, they put in numbers, like 30 days, two aircraft, and a location, and they say go, and it, this whole process can take 30 minutes if it's done properly. Once that happens, then the individual organizations uh, under AF North, there's, a no, there's another organization called the Aerospace um, Expeditionary Group for Wildland Firefighting that's created. And in that process, let me back up one, that AEG is the military liaison between U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Defense, or the Department of Agriculture and Department of Defense. That colonel, uh, the AEG commander, the group commander, is in charge of all eight aircraft. It has the fiduciary responsibility and the operational responsibility to making sure that the mission gets done from a military sense and offers up these, air, these aircraft up to eight and then acts as their commander. And it is li quite literally their commander or their coordinating commander. Uh, it gets into the weeds about Title 10 and Title 32, which is my forte, but I don't want to bore you with that. Uh, but that one individual then is the Department of Defense's uh, single point of contact for execution of these military assets. Let's go back to the dispatch process for, for firefighting. Remember that lightning strike and that incident commander. Uh, if a fire gets a little bit larger than just a small fire, usually that means that you're going to have a, a some sort of aviation asset uh, like a helicopter or more than one helicopter, uh, multiple helicopters or more than one air tanker, you're going to have, uh, under the incident command structure, you'll have a, a what's called an air operations branch director, or AOBD, that handles the air war for the incident commander. Now, remember, these people are civilians, and their method of fighting a war is quite different than a military fighting a war. Um, these folks fight a battle based on a lot of other factors uh, that a military uh, commander may not even imagine. A military commander is given a task. Take that village, destroy that bridge, uh, destroy that airfield, take the airfield. Uh, and when that commander is, is given that task of destroying that bridge, there's not a whole hell of a lot that's going to stop in that, in, in that way of destroying that bridge. And it'll bring a full force of of kinetic energy to, to, to destroy that bridge. The incident commander, <laughs> even though he wants to stop the fire normally, may not want to stop the fire so quickly. 
they want to may want to manage the fire if it's a small uh, slow licking fire they may want to allow it to burn the underbrush so that it is a it becomes a healthy forest again they might may want to burn one area and not burn an area they, another area they may want to direct a fire over here and they want to may want to prioritize these areas over here where there's where there's homes and not prior to prioritize an area on another area so the so the the the, the battle becomes complicated and it becomes uh, their battle, not the military battle. So our responsibility as a military is to is to provide a tool to them, but not to to wage the battle for them. So, uh, and that's really difficult for a number of military commanders to to come to terms with, is that we want to put that fire out, and they may not want to do that. So we've got it. We have to train our commanders in that regard. In this case, the air air operations branch director is handling the air war. And they're the ones that make the phone calls to the Geographic Air Coordination Center, the GAC, for aircraft. When, they, when this request goes to the GAC for air tanker support, the GAC submits the request to dispatch agency. They also carbon copy the other uh, GACs in the country and the National Aid, uh, Coordination Center at Boise. But it's now the dispatch facility, let's say San Bernardino Dispatch or Riverside Dispatch, to hand these aircraft off. So the GAC says, you now have the responsibility of producing lead airplanes and mass aircraft. Dispatch is the one who says, we're gonna put a lead aircraft on a particular fire, and we're gonna put this particular air tanker on that particular fire. Say there's six different fires, dispatch will be managing six or 10 different incidents, and they can be from fires to car crashes to planes crashes to, so this dispatch can be quite busy. But that dispatch agency is just, says, I'm gonna use lead 58, for example, on this particular incident, and I'm going to assign that particular aircraft over to that fire. In doing so, they send a message down to the air tanker base. Now the air tanker base is responsible for getting that lead airplane out onto the fire and then servicing these, these air tankers, including MAV-6 in this example, so that they hit that fire based on what the air AOBD wants. So the dispatch gives them the air tankers, the air tanker base says, okay, now I, I know I'm gonna send lead 5-8 to, to the Camarillo Springs fire, and I'm going to assign MAF-6 to that fire as well. So lead 5-8 will then use MAF-6. Does that make sense of how that whole process works? This does take a little bit of time, and these folks here typically are weighing a tremendous amount of information as to decide whether or not they wanna allow the dispatch of these air tankers. This air tanker, can cost six, six, seven, eight thousand dollars an hour to operate. This this lead plane could be six, five, six hundred dollars an hour to operate. When you start putting an aircraft that's cost six thousand dollars an hour to operate, and dispensing three thousand gallons roughly of retardant at a cost of about six to eight thousand dollars per load onto a fire, and you expect them to fly ten or twelve hours or eight hours, and dispense maybe ten to fifteen drops on that fire a day the costs skyrocket. So these guys at the Geographic Air Coordination Center make informed decisions about what resources to put and where, and they make them based on a number of factors, including do they want the area to burn, uh, which is trying to make the healthy forest? Do they uh, want to put the fire out? Is there, wireland, or is there a wildland urban interface issue where there's a bunch of homes or buildings in the area? Is there communications facilities they want to save? is the cost benefit ratio worth it? And you'll find that more often than not, the criticism for putting air tankers or not putting air tankers hits right here at the Geographic Area Coordination Center. Um, we had a, a situation in Colorado Springs where there was a fire that was within sight of the air tanker base. Um, these guys didn't react quick enough and they lost about 140 homes. Um, uh, that's enough said on that. In every chain of, in every military organization, there's a military chain of command. And uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with military and military chains of command, but uh, everyone from the lowest ranking enlisted individual all the way up to the uh, four star general and the secretary of defense <clears throat> has, is part of a wiring diagram. That enlisted person has a supervisor who normally has a commander who then has a commander above them who has a squadron commander, for example, and a group commander, and then a wing commander, and then an air force commander, and then and so on. 
So we have these wiring diagrams, and that's how we deploy these units in packages, if you will. Um, say you want an airlift unit. Uh, you you say I want to have a, a an airlift unit that takes a certain there's a commander, operations officers, there's planners, there's uh, logistics officers, and things like that, all the way down to the people who are actually loading and, and unloading the aircraft. They have to have that chain of command to be to, to function within the military process. This is for the military chain of command for aerial firefighting. The Secretary of Defense is quite literally in charge of and has the authority to say yes or no uh, to do aerial firefighting in this role. He is, uh, has established this Joint Director of, of Military Support to be able to handle these types of requests for civil assets to be put out onto um, fires, for example, or for moving equipment into a, into a hurricane zone, things like that. JDOMS does all that. They've established this defense coordinating officer at NIFSI. Remember, NIFSI is that is that facility in Boise, Idaho. It's a national interagency inter fire center. We have a military person in that facility that coordinates with JDOMS. So when NIFSI makes a request, they give the request to this DCO. This DCO is supposed to be able to, to speak and understand Forest Service talk and speak and understand military talk and to be able to translate between the two of them. And that's how that that's why that person's there is to be able to translate the needs and and vocabulary between these two different agencies. Once that request for for maps is made, this this person no longer becomes part of the chain of command. It just becomes an advisor. JDOMS then under the standing DISCA exhort authorizes Northcom to handle the emergency. And Northcom, in addition to handling uh, satellites and our nuclear program and a bunch of other things handles defense support and civil authority within the continental United States. <clears throat> so Northcom has a air wing underneath it, or the Air Force, or the Air the Joint Forces Air Component Commander. There's also a Joint Forces Ground Component Commander <clears throat> for the Army side. So on occasion, NIFSI will say we want to have a brigade of. Uh, of army men to come out and help cut lines, actually be ground firefighters, that request will go through the DCO to JNOMS, to NORTHCOM. And in that case, you'll see a different arrow that goes over to a, a JFLIC, which is a ground combatant commander who then handles the ground, combat, uh, ground war. In the case of aviation assets, they've given it to AFNORTH because AFNORTH is typically your air, your air and space organization under NORTHCOM. Uh, it's interesting to note that Army assets, uh, Title 10 Army assets and Title 10 Navy assets and Marine assets all fall under the AFNORTH, which is typically an Air Force commander uh, under, and they fall under AFNORTH when they are assigned to the AEG for wildland firefighting. So as uh, this AEG becomes the focal point between the civilian agency and the MAFs organizations. And you could also put other aircraft out there, <clears throat> including Title 10 uh, helicopters um, and other Title 10 transport category aircraft working under a fire request. So uh, we also have, right now we have a C-26 aerial reconnaissance aircraft that's being used. And that C-26 is attached under this AEG construct as well. That in, that's 106 kernel here drives everything that's usually Air Force or, I mean, the military aviation-related assets underneath it. Under this AEG, we can form up to four different squadrons, so we can deploy four different locations if we wanted to. Uh, each of these locations would have a commander and an aircraft assigned to them. <clears throat> this is a civilian chain of command. Very, very flat. The um, Incident commander basically runs the entire war. And the incident commander basically says, I need resources to fight this fire. I need dozers, I need hand crews, I need helicopters, I need air tankers. They make those decisions very locally at the fire. It's quite interesting that they have how much power is in this incident commander's um, uh, venue. And you'll see, uh, if you look at the NIFC sit rep, you'll see IMTs or incident management teams type one, type twos, 
an in, a type one incident management team is the largest incident management team. We currently have 15 of those deployed right now. And in that they have a huge uh, uh, organization of logistics and air operations, ground operations, all sorts of different types of things, finance, all those kinds of things are underneath that one incident commander, the IMTT. They make their requests for resources of this geographic area coordination center. This GAC, again, is nothing more than a resource supplier. They can say, hey, yes, you can have the air tankers. Here's how many you can have. Uh, yes, you can have hand crews. Here's how many you can have. Once they said, yes, you can have a uh, air tanker and that air tanker is going to be MAFs, NIFC makes a decision in coordination with the AEG, which aircraft to use. And once they have that, they, they establish a, a squadron, say a McClellan, for example, right now, and they establish a, a MAFs liaison officer. This person speaks military and Forest Service. This person speaks military and uh, they make it all work. This is the air tanker base. The, the MAFs liaison officer works with the air tanker base. Our aircraft commander, <coughs> excuse me, does not communicate necessarily directly with the air tanker base folks uh, during the fight. They're simply given a dispatch that says, go to this fire and, and join up with the lead pilot. There's decisions about whether or not we're gonna put these aircraft onto the fire or not is made by the mass liaison officer. <clears throat> we spoke about this a little bit earlier. The AEG commander works with the, the NIC assistant manager and at the NIFC, um, in the fire center in Boise, all of these organizations are present. And all of these organizations are a committee and to get decisions out of this committee can be quite difficult. They, may, they meet every day during the, when, the, when the preparedness level goes up to five, and I can talk about that later if we want. But as fires build throughout the country, resources are in demand. And when you start running out of resources, they increase this preparedness level. PL5 is the highest level. And at PL5, they're meeting every day. I think even PL4, they're meeting every day as well. <clears throat> but in this committee is the Forest Service, NOAA, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs, National Park Service, uh, United States uh, uh, Fire Association, uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. There's a couple other organizations in there too. And they are a committee. And they go behind a closed door. So in the, in the morning meeting, and I've been into a hundreds of them. They, it's a more of a public discussion. And then they excuse everybody out and then, then they make decisions about where they're gonna distribute these assets. They're gonna say, we're gonna put air tankers over here, we're not gonna put them over there. We're gonna take our air tankers away from this fire to put them over in that fire. And these those decisions have consequences. <clears throat> Houses can burn, uh, wildlife, habit, wildlife habitat can burn. Uh, and these folks like with the BLM and the Indian Affairs, um, they have quite a bit of say. Fish and Wildlife Service says, yeah, we want it to burn because we need the habitat to, to regenerate. Where uh, BIA may say, no, we have uh, reservation, we have sacred grounds that we don't want burnt. So they make some pretty heavy decisions within this committee. <laughs> and they, they, they tend to always wait until five o'clock on a Friday afternoon to, to initiate their decision. So that's how we get out to fires and how the structure works. And you can see how complicated that can get. Now, my goal through when I was uh, uh, the SME, the subject matter expert in this whole thing was to simplify, streamline, and uh, uh, make it a, um, a very uh, reactive organization. Um, and so almost all of those documents, all of that structure, all of that stuff are all by templates and automatic. When you turn it on, it automatically happens very, very quickly. All of the structure comes into place. It can take us as little as five hours, and I, I say that lightly because five hours is the absolute minimum time with, if you have all of the planets in line, you can get an aircraft out within five hours to put retardant down on an aircraft. Normally it takes 24 to 48 hours from the time of request. And that's to get the aircraft off the line, get the system loaded, get the crews and crew rest, get all that stuff. <clears throat> the five hour rule, we've only used a couple times, and that one was, for example, the Colorado Springs fire. Where the aircraft were right there, we actually had a map system loaded on an aircraft because we were in a training mode just before that. 
we had a crew in, in, in on station that was capable of doing it and they had crew rest to do it. So they were, they were, everything was ready. What took the time was to move the aircraft over to the pit, as you can see in the bottom, load it over tar and then go. <clears throat> so five hours is an absolute minimum with all of the plants in perfect alignment, typically 24 to 48 hours to get out, which is really quite fast. It's probably one of the fastest military reaction times of any kind of tactical airlift capability within the United States Air Force. Uh, in operations, I'm gonna cover these topics. I'm gonna, we're gonna show some really quickly how, to, how it's loaded. Uh, or photograph of it being loaded. We're gonna cover some of the ground equipment items, <clears throat> what a pit looks like, uh, the different kinds of lead aircraft we fly behind, how we perform a drop preparation, join up and actually execute the drop. This is a MAPS trailer, it's custom designed. This is the MAPS system. You can see this large air cylinder here. There's two of them, and again, they're natural gas bus, or they're bus natural gas fuel tanks. <clears throat> for buses that are in the city, running around the city. So they're designed to a Department of Transportation standard and a burst standard we had to run through. This is the large tank and it's, it is a single tank. These welds are all x-rayed and routinely checked. Uh, and it rolls on and off this custom trailer that was built to be able to put it, all this stuff into the aircraft in one shot. That's a compressor right there. This is a, air, air, uh, a water oil separator. And there's these giant electrical motors right there. This electrical cabinet there. These high pressure lines. There's a pressure regulator right here. This is a high pressure line up at the top. We literally ramp, chalk the aircraft, put this put this uh, <clears throat> pyramid underneath the back of the aircraft so it doesn't fall on its tail, and push it in, or winch it in. Uh, this is a ground-based air compressor. This uh, these are built in Germany. Uh, at least the ones we had, I had when I was there. They're built in Germany. They're custom made. <clears throat> They're designed to be put in the back of C-130 aircraft, and they can, like I say, pump a, a scuba tank up in less than 60 seconds. <clears throat> this is the MAPS-1 system. You can see the nozzles sticking out the back. This system was very dependent upon these, these ground-based uh, air compressors. So this, in this uh, example, you'll see this MAPS pit, and there's some interesting things here. This is retardant that is being mixed. This is water line, I'm sorry, this is a, a air line blowing dust from these packages here and water line coming in to mix and, and distribute water and this dust. This dust is FOSCheck. And this FOSCheck is very much like miracle Grow, and we'll talk about that later, but it's a retardant. It gets blown in here, sucked into here, mixed and then blown into here where these vats of this goopy, snotty consistency retardant are then pumped out under pressure through this manifold this manifold then goes out to these, these um, uh, a hose that's loaded on, that's mounted on dollies that's been connected to the MAF system and loaded. The MAF 2 system is loaded very similar to the MAF 1 system in, retard in the way of retardant. While the aircraft are on the ground, we'll also use the, air, the ground compressors to pump air because the compressors that are built inside for the aircraft, they, they can compress the aircraft in, up to, in about 30 minutes, which is 15 minutes after the fire, 15 minutes to a fire, you should be good but uh, they generate a tremendous amount of heat. So we try to prefer to use the ground-based air compressors when, if they're available. So this is a pit. We also have refueling here, uh, and there's a whole dance that goes on in the pit. These are examples of lead aircraft. We're no longer using the Barons. Uh, we are, um, this is a Baron here. We're using King Airs. These King Airs are the primary lead aircraft. We also use OB-10 Broncos, which is very fun to fly. I'm one of very few military uh, pilots, military officers that have gone through the uh, uh, the lead plane or the air attack course. Uh, it's the air, air taker group supervisor course, ATGS. And I was able to fly um, the OB-10 Bronco, the, the uh, uh, King Airs, the S2s, the Hueys. I got to do some bucket drops, really kind of fun stuff. Um, so these are the lead planes that we fly with. This is the old pipe uh, 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 aircraft that we used to fly with. To execute a drop, we have to prepare the system for drop. We have to load that air, air, air pressure. So, so this happens in flight. <clears throat> this system has got say 25 or 3,500 gallons of 3,000 gallons of retardant in there. 
and it weighs 27,000 pounds. It's nine pounds per gallon, uh, nine point, up to 9.3 pounds per gallon because it has clays and things in it. Uh, and inside there, there's an air gap, which we pressurize with high pressure air, air through this line right here. So during the preparation for drop, we need to know how much retardant that the, the lead plane wants to put down. And he gives us that into these coverage levels. If he says coverage level eight, he wants eight gallons per hundred square feet. So that drives a particular setting on this console here that this load master dials in. He dials a knob and says coverage level eight, and that dials a pressure setting here, and computer controls the nozzle to how long a nozzle, and how far that nozzle retracts, and how long it is, is retracted for. They can also do the, the programming of the fuel of the foam tank as well at this station right here. So during the, bro, the drop preparation checklist, air is loaded on the top, the system is armed and ready to go. At that point, we lead, we're joining up with the lead plane, and this is a picture of us being behind the lead plane, and I've got some pretty cool videos of this. And we follow the lead plane in a pattern that's very similar to a landing pattern at an airport. And uh, so we have a downwind, a base, and a final. And we don't get down into the terrain really until we're on base and final. And when I say down into the terrain, I'm talking about 150 feet with a 165,000 pound airplane uh, behind a lead plane with flaps at 100 down a canyon next to a fire that's blowing wind in temperatures up to 110 and 120 degrees. Uh, so we don't want to get down into the risk environment, the high risk environment, until we absolutely have to. So we'll typically stay a thousand feet up and then we'll we'll step down on base and then step down on final, down the target. During drop execution, so now we're on final, we're in position between behind this lead plane. The lead plane says, I want you to start the retardant at this location and I want you to stop it or just let it run out. And normally nowadays we have, uh, they have smoke generators and they can pop smoke as to where they want us to start. And you'll see some of that in the videos. The co-pilot is actually the one who pulls the trigger. It's the aircraft commander, the guy in the left seat, guy or gal in the left seat that actually is flying the airplane. And we want that division of duty so that the guy flying the airplane or gal flying the airplane doesn't hit the terrain, doesn't hit the lead plane, puts the aircraft in a position that's in trail of the lead plane, puts it on the right altitude, on the right vector down if it's a descending drop, all in position. So they've got to fly the airplane, got to keep the speed under control and so on. The co-pilot's got to have one eye on the airspeed indicator, one eye on the terrain, one hand on the trigger, and one hand on the flaps. And that you'll see it all come together in this in these videos, <clears throat> how it all kind of comes together using the procedures to do it. <clears throat> Again, the retardant comes out in three to five seconds. It's about 30,000 pounds, 27,000 pounds and some change. The pilot is net flying the aircraft down, and this thing pumps out the 13,800 pounds of thrust. Nose tracks right, he's got to correct with rudder. Trim changes, thinking of taking 27,000 pounds off of an airplane, it becomes an elevator. So he's got to fly that aircraft down the ground, down that, and he's got to hold that until load clear. Uh, and that's where we get very close to flap limiting speeds and the pilot, the, the co-pilot is then gonna to have to pull up flaps and tell the air, aircraft commander. Once we hear load, load clear, then we pull the aircraft up away from the terrain and we start reconfiguring, we add power, we get the flaps up to 50 and we get flying up out of that risk area. It's quite fun. <clears throat> Release point and escapes. This is the run in and this is a, a turning, uh, this is actually an unusual drop. This is a turning drop and this is a direct attack. A direct attack means the fire is burning hot and the incident commander wants to cool it down. So in this case, he's laying retardant directly on top of the fire, which is usually not normal. Normally we lay a retardant out in front of the fire to allow the fire to burn to the retardant. But in this case, they, this, this example is, he's putting retardant right on the fire, and that's to cool it down. There's the lead plate right there. This is the older system. You can see how it blew up against the tail, and this became uh, droplets. One of the main differences between our air tankers and the MAFS world and civilian air tankers, which I can talk to later if, if you wish, <clears throat> is the type, is how we dispense retardant. In our systems, we, we dispense the retardant under air pressure. Commercial air tankers use gravity feed. Gravity feed is a 
causes the retardant to come out of the aircraft as a large ball of water. In our system, we blow it out under pressure and it becomes an aerosol. The idea is, is that in both cases, you want to get the retardant into atomize, into droplets, and to cover the fuel evenly. Gravity feed systems have the advantage of that ball of water staying coagulated and then dispersing later, and they can get higher coverage levels in, in, in smaller areas. We have the advantage that we can cover uh, the fuels in very evenly. And um, <clears throat> because it's under pressure and it comes out as droplets, we can actually drop on, on things. If a civilian air tanker was to drop on a dozer, it would knock the dozer over one of those 20, 25 or 30,000 pound dozers. I've seen them just knocked over and the person either hurt or killed that's in that dozer if they weren't smart enough to run away or, sh or get shielded behind it. So that big bottle of that big um, uh, water drop, big ball of water can flatten the house. We can actually drop on houses uh, and other things. And I've actually done that. I've dropped on a mobile home, uh, saved the occupant, saved the mobile home. <clears throat> so this is a, a, an example of, of the aircraft following, trying to follow the terrain because we want to maintain 170 feet and we can't see 20 feet, so we shoot for 150 feet on the, on the altimeter, radio altimeter. We want that constant altitude to go as we as we descend down. And it is really difficult to do that, especially when this aircraft is losing weight and lifting up away from the, the uh, terrain. So in a good drop, you'll, it'll follow terrain evenly 150 feet down, all the way down the terrain. This is kind of what it should look like on a flat terrain. You can see that the, that it's that it's boiling out and it's under pressure, so it's it's atomizing. By the time it gets back here, you can see that everything under pressure is is expanding into water droplets. This is what the water droplets look from the ground level. You can see a sheeting action of rain, and it's literally phoscheck rain. These are little cups out here, and this is the proving ground to determine what kind of coverage levels your system can do. So this was done up in. Um, this, I think this is Marana, Arizona. It's also done in Chico, California. And they, the, in Chico, we had uh, the convicts from the local prison out and they would put these little Dixie cups out and then they would put a cap on them after they dropped and they would weigh them. And that's how they would determine by this grid pattern how much retardant got down onto the, uh, the, the target area. And I'll show you some examples of uh, the data that's been that's derived from that. But in, in essence, this is the perfect way you want the swirling atomized to uh, retardant to come down and cover the fuel. All right, so let's talk about retardants and we're getting close to the end. <clears throat> and then we'll go into some another video, a couple of videos and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through those. Retardants are basically chemicals that are used to slow down the production of fire. And everybody remembers the fire triangle. <clears throat> uh, fuel, heat, and uh, oxygen. And what these retardants do is they don't put the fire out, but they, they, they cause that combustion process to be modified and to be slowed down dramatically. So if we can slow down the, the one of those um, sides of the triangle, then maybe we can counterbalance the triangle and knock the fire out. If we can cool it down, if we can, uh, if we can reduce the amount of fuel available, uh, then we can maybe maybe actually put the fire out if we can knock it out completely. So what the retardants do is they interrupt the uh, the destruction of the cellulose material in fire, in fuels, so that they don't produce oxygen and they become less of a fuel, if you will. That's it in a nutshell. Complicated as it is. Uh, but let's say, let's start from uh, here. Chem they're, they're chemical fire, they're usually liquid in form, and with, we usually dispense them while airborne. Uh, Foscheck and the company, um, let me change the name to Foscheck. They used to be Monsanto, uh, Istaris, chemical companies. <coughs> I think they're called Foscheck now. They, you can actually buy it at, uh, you can buy cans of it at Home Depot, I think now, and you can mix it up and spray it on your own around your own house. Uh, but normally it's done by airborne and either by a helicopter or air tanker 
for the MAF system, it takes us about 15 minutes to load it in, depending, and that depends upon how much pressure that pump and that manifold can handle. Because it's got um, solids in it, those solids will settle. So we can only leave it in the aircraft for 72 hours. So once we pump it into the aircraft, if we get canceled, in the 72 hour point, we're gonna have to take it out and dump it. Water is also a retardant. Remember the fire triangle, if you cool it down, you can, you can stop it. Other technologies, such as foams, which are surficants, um, and surficants essentially change the way water, it, it breaks up the surface tension of the water and it changes the way the, the fuel accepts the water. If you use a foam and you splash it onto a tree, the, the water is more likely to penetrate the tree, penetrate the fuel. Um, enough said. Most of those surfacants are a little bit dangerous to be working with, though. Our retardant or FOSCheck is pre predominantly ammonium phosphate salts. They also put some thickeners in there to make it so it doesn't, uh, so that it holds together, but then it goes into uh, droplets. They add coloring and water. Coloring is so that as pilots, we can see where we've already dropped and water to make, take the dust and make it into a, something that can be dispensed out the system. We used to, we used to add re, uh, rust inhibitors. There are some in there now, but they're very, very benign. The old rust inhibitors are actually poisonous. Um, Foscheck, let me back up a little bit here. Because that's ammonium phosphate salts, you can think of the retardant as miracle Grow fertilizer. And just as you would not want to dump a huge load of miracle Grow in your koi pond, you would not want to put a lot of retardant into, into waterways. <clears throat> so we are very careful about, unless we absolutely have to, we, we try to keep our retardant out of waterways, streams, creeks, lakes, ponds, because as the sunlight hits it, in some types of retardants, as sunlight hits it, the chemical reaction creates cyanide gas. And that cyanide gas kills fish fry, little fish, <clears throat> and other little creatures that can't handle that low amounts of, of that gas. And so we try to minimize that if, if at all possible. And they've come up with a whole different types of retardants that try to minimize that, that, that chemical reaction uh, as well. And so we're, we don't want to ham, uh, damage any of the wildlife any more than we have to. We also don't want that wildlife to be boiled alive either. So there's a balancing act in there and we have the lead planes have these maps that say, don't drop here, drop there, don't drop here. And uh, we as aircraft commanders flying the airplane, if we see that body of water, we have to speak up, make sure that's what the low lead plane wants or just simply not drop on it. <clears throat> so and there's tremendous amount of studies about efficacy and um, they use trout and they, uh, the trout fry and how long the trout fry lasts. And there's a very interesting study back many years ago I saw that, that they had these petri dishes with these fish fry in it and they would put a drop of retardant in it and expose it to sunlight and the fish would just die. So we, we, don't, we try not to hurt them. Uh, there was a big lawsuit here locally in Santa Barbara where a helicopter dropped a bunch of retardant accidentally into the creek and boy, they, they caught hell for it. So let's talk about fire fire, FOSCheck specifically and that's a, it's a company, it's also a, a brand of retardant. It's, it comes in as a dry powder or a liquid concentrate. And I gotta tell you, there's some bases out there that have liquid concentrate and you gotta be very careful because when you mix this stuff, this is 12 pounds per gallon. And if you don't mix it right, you won't get nine pounds per gallon. You'll get 12 pounds per gallon, which will exceed your gross weight of your aircraft. So they have to be very careful about how they, they dispense this or mix this liquid in. And we use a, a, a densitometer uh, called a micromotion machine that as we are creating this, this retardant and loading it on the airplane, it goes through this, this micromotion machine, which is a densitometer, and it's constantly monitoring to make sure we have the correct amount of weight going on the airplane because we don't want to overmax the aircraft. It's produced in a bunch of different colors, typically uh, orange, reddish, and they add a fugitive to it. <clears throat> so when it's, when it's exposed to sunlight on the terrain, it actually turns brown. So as we're fighting the fire, it's orange, but after a couple of days, it'll turn brown. 
and so we can see it. If you've ever been up into the Sierras and you've seen orange painted rocks, those were retardants that were used before they put the fugitive in there to, to convert that iron oxide into something that was less. And those basically they painted those they, they spray painted those rocks orange and they're going to stay orange. Uh, Foscheck in particular, and there's there's variants of Foscheck and different amounts of the of these um, phosphates and sulfates, um, but predominantly the ammonium phosphate, diammonium phosphate, uh, diammonium sulfate, monoammonium phosphate, clay, and gum, and some secrets. The clay and the gum hold it together. The sulfates act as a fire retardant, and then once they're done they turn into, into fertilizer. It's interesting that when you go to an air tanker base, especially the Channel Islands air tanker base, which we've created, uh, after fire season, the best growing plants are next to the, <laughs> the tanker base because the excess retardant that gets splashed over into the, into the dirt near it uh, creates a nice green uh, fauna. This is, remember we were talking about those, um, Dixie cups on that testing facility. This is the results of those Dixie cups. When they weigh each of those Dixie cups on that big grid, when we dropped over the grid, the retardant fell into the Dixie cups, put a cap on it, they weigh them, and they put it into the computer. This is what you get. These are drop patterns. This is drop four, one third of the, of the drop, about 900 gallons, about 155 feet, and uh, they descended to 160 feet, and they were 124 knots. All of these factors are important to making sure that they've got consistent numbers out of here. And you'll see that coverage level eight is this green area. Coverage level 10 is this, this magenta area. So we get quite a number of areas of heavy concentration in here of coverage level 10 or 10 gallons per 100 square feet. But most of the stuff is in coverage level four or better. This is a Second, third, setting two. Now this is, so a setting four, which should give you a higher pressure, should give you four gallons per 100 square feet. This one should give you two gallons per 100 square feet over a longer area. And so you're dispensing 3,000 gallons of retardant. These are all 3,000 gallon runs. This one would be used in grasslands where the fuel is fine and, and dispersed. You would use this in woodland and this in a mix. So you would want a lot of retardant in a small area or, or retardant across a large area. Does that make sense? Remember when we had that picture of me dropping in that training scenario, this is the water. I was told to drop in between the runway and the taxiway, which I seem to hit that pretty well. And this is about 30 minutes later. And you can see these pools of water. That's quite a bit of water and a spot in, in a hot, uh, airport. So this is a summary of the training event that I was at, uh, and it'll show you the uh, loading of the retardant, those uh, the hoses on the dollies and stuff like that in the, in the pit. You'll also see there's a tremendous amount of wind. Watch his, this is his this drift cool factor. Spring afternoon over the Nantahala Fort. See his nose? Carolina. Tremendous amount, he's pointing into the wind. Overpowers a tiny U.S. Forest Service King Air lead plane, who guides it to over some of the most picturesque terrain found in the country. As the C-130J, or Super Herc, drops a white tail of water just above the treetops. This is all part of the annual Modular Airborne Firefighting System Certification Training held by the U.S. Forest Service to train pilots, load masters, and ground and support crews from around the country. The 146 airlift wing from Channel Islands Air National Guard Station was testing their new C-130J aircraft equipped with the newest aerial firefighting system called NAS-2. Our unit is lucky enough to have the, the newest C 130J, and now we have the newest the NASA. He was the wing commander and, and the AEG commander at the time. So we've got Paul Hargrove, a very good friend of mine. Right now, newest, one of the best retarded system that's out in the world. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to helping. The legacy mass system required the ramp and door of the C 130 to remain open during flight, out of which two tubes were extended to drop fire retardant. The new MAS-2 system, like the legacy system, will roll into and out of the C-130, 
A major difference in the new system is one large nozzle placed out of a modified left paratroop door. This nozzle, equipped with an onboard compressor, is capable of spraying a pressurized 3,000 gallons of fire return. Or in this case, we'll... I want you to notice that that aircraft, the tail of that aircraft pushed up. And that's a testament to the, the power of velocity of that fluid coming out. Water in five to seven seconds. A self-contained compressor saves valuable time and money by eliminating the necessity of ground support compressors. It makes it nice that the MAPS-2 is a completely autonomous self-contained system where we can take it to an outbase, recharge and reload the system and then press without having all this other infrastructure around. It's more efficient. It's safer for us to fly. Is it's a good looking uh, guy. It, it's uh, more economical to fly. We can fly faster, farther, using less fuel. We can climb higher. We can drop, because it's pressurized, we can drop all the way up to the tree line. The 146 Airlift Wing is the only Air National Guard unit in the world flying the new C-130J, equipped with a MAPS-2 system. The MAPS mission is a special one amongst all other missions in the firefighting community because of its rich 30-year history and the relationships formed between the agencies over the years. It's a fun mission. It's a challenging mission. It can be a little stressful sometimes, uh, but that's what makes it makes it interesting. Is you, get, you get tested when you come do something like this. And uh, I love being around, like a lot of people in the Air Force, I love being around airplanes and uh, the, jet, you know, the sound of the airplanes. And, and it's, a, it's a fun, exciting, it's a meaningful mission. And I like being involved with something that really matters. Reporting for the 146 Airlift Wing, Tech Sergeant Ty Moore, Greenville, South Carolina. So that's a presentation I have. I have some videos to show. Did we have any questions at this point? Okay, good. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> We did have one question so far. Um, uh, th thank you for an informative topic. Uh, you might have actually addressed this, but uh, the question is when flying uh, the maps, uh, the pilot has to be extremely experienced. Uh, do you, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, let me, let me try that again. Pilot should be extremely experienced to monitor the speed of the aircraft when uh, there's turbulence to do uh, smoke and clouds over the fire. So I believe the question is that uh, when there's, you know, how do you deal with the turbulence uh, for the smoke and fire, uh, the, uh, the fire over the fire? Well, so <clears throat> the heat you can feel because it's radiant heat, um, but the smoke we try not to fly into. Uh, specifically, well, first off, the air crews that are permitted to fly this mission set are the cream of the crop. We don't, a, a, in order to become a co-pilot, you have already have to be a, co a aircraft commander or an instructor pilot before you even considered to be able to come in, into this mission set because it's so risky. That being said, you get the top top air aviators flying the airplane. Now, as, as far as the process, we don't fly within the in smoke plume directly. And you're going to see some videos. I, I'll show a video that of um, smoky area, but not the plume itself. We had an aircraft over the Kennedy Meadows fire years ago uh, near uh, Fresno, just east of Fresno, that the lead plane pilot turned too sharp and they can turn sharp, we can't, we're a large, like a cruise ship. <clears throat> so he went through the plume and in the plume are unburnt gases and no oxygen. And they flamed out uh, two of their engines and they were gonna flame the, the third with a third going down and they were gonna crash. They straightened out, they dropped, dropped the load, <clears throat> and were able to recover that one air engine and then restart a third engine. Uh, <clears throat> and that, so that's very dangerous to fly through the smoke plumes and we don't do that, uh, obviously. However, there is a tremendous amount of uh, turbulence and <clears throat> we just have to be cognizant of that. I, I was dropping, uh, trying to save a communications tower uh, on the Los Alamos fire in New Mexico, uh, right near the, uh, nuclear facility, and the communications towers were basically the large cell, cell phone towers, and they were bordered by, it was on a, on, a, on a curve of two mountain ridges, and the wind was howling from my left, and as soon as I crossed where that communications tower was, the other mountain ridge blocked the wind, and so I was crabbed into the wind, essentially pointing straight at that communications tower, 
uh, with probably a 15 to 20 knot wind gusting to 30 or so. And as soon as I <laughs> passed that other ridge, I was now tracking straight at the communications tower, which which uh, my eyes got big and, and you pull off. So you, go, you have to be cognizant of the rotor cloud coming off of the terrain. You gotta be cognizant of the wind velocity, where it's coming from, whether it's headwind. Uh, you have to have an escape plan. Uh, so you're constantly watching all of those factors. <clears throat> and that's why we train. So that your experienced aircraft commanders and instructor pilots go as a co-pilot and they spend several seasons watching the other guy fly before they move over to the left seat and become in charge of flying them because it is, it is quite dangerous. We also train every year in mountain flying, tactical airlift type of flying. Uh, and the, you gotta remember that these C-130 aircraft uh, are used in a combat scenario and they are flown in at minimum altitudes into combat zones where people are shooting at you and you wanna be as low as possible because there's no other, you don't have an offensive capability with these aircraft, it's all defensive. And your biggest defense is being low. So these air crews are trained in a military sense to, to fly very, very low to the ground. Now, in this case, we're flying on 150 feet and the Air Force trains the, the, the average tactical airlift pilot down to 300 feet modified contour. So our margin is much smaller in this one, but it takes those, those combat trained killers to fly this mission even lower <clears throat> into that environment. Hopefully that answered the question. Oh, thank you. Uh, next question, which I think you just answered, uh, what's the minimum altitude allowed for the operation? Well, well, we say 150 feet. The optimum drop altitude is 170 feet, and that's that's determined by the retardant feet folks in San Dimas uh, testing facility, which is U.S. Forest Service Department of Agriculture facility, I think. It's either that or, or Department of Interior. The BLM and, and U.S. and Forest Service work together. So I'm not sure if it's a BLM facility or a Forest Service facility, now that I think about it, but um, they, they're they the ones that do the research and testing on the retardants, and they're, they're the ones that say what altitude, what velocity, uh, what forward throw, uh, what temperatures and things make it sense uh, to drop or dispense uh, uh, retardant at. And so typically we, sh we, sh we shoot for 150 feet at 120 knots as the target speed. And again, these aircraft are between 155 and 165,000 pounds uh, maneuvering down that canyon, which is at max gross weight. Fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite fun. And it's one of the things I miss in the military, well, one of the few things I miss in the military is flying this particular mission set. Uh, what activities take place after a return from a drop? Uh, are there any activities required before the next load? Uh, very few. We, pre we, we prepare the aircraft for the next load of retardant. Uh, so when we talk to the lead plane pilot, there's a whole discussion going on, and you'll hear load and return or load and hold uh, or just hold. And if you get a return uh, message from the lead plane, uh, they will, will, will reconfigure the aircraft, will pump the air, the air tanks back up, and we'll set the system up so that you can load retardant back onto it. So coming off of the drop, we're we're reconfiguring the aircraft for normal flights or bringing up the flaps or accelerating out. And while we're doing that, we're turning on the air compressors if we, if we need to, and then uh, flying back to the air tanker base to get retardant. And then we land, come into the pit, which is a dance into itself because these pits are very tight. Uh, we shut down the outboard engines and we taxi in on two engines and two inboard engines. And we'll actually taxi out on, in, on two engines normally as well, which is hard to do when it's a heavy airplane and it's hot out. And then we'll start up the other two air engines as we actually taxi out. Uh, but coming in, we'll shut down the outboard for safety reasons, and we'll taxi in to the pit, and we'll unload. Most of the times, the crews will stay in inside the aircraft. Typically, you see one to three or four drops a day. Sometimes, depending upon the, the season, you'll see sometimes between five and eight drops a day. And on the hairy seasons, you'll, I, I've dropped 16 times in one day, which is my record, which is a very long day. It did well deserve a beer after that. <laughs> all right, uh, that's all the questions we got at the moment. Uh, any, any folks who have come up with more, uh, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A window. And uh, Ryan, if you wanna uh, go ahead and, and show your videos, that'd be great. Yeah, let me, uh, let me start, let me kill the PowerPoint. I don't need to do that. Let me share the movies and TV, this one here. All right, so this video, 
and I will make it full screen. Tell me if it's full screen. Uh, it is. Let me let me move off here. Okay, full screen. So why do I have these videos? Um, so I was the guy in charge, right? This this subject matter expert for the National Guard. And one of the things, and I was also uh, in charge of, of getting the MAF system loaded onto C-130J aircraft. And there's a big difference between the C-130J, there's a number, number of big differences between the C-130H model and the J model. The H model have four bladed props. They, they were adding some bigger engines and bigger props on them now, but back then they had four bladed props. They were very simple aircraft and they had steam gauges primarily. They had some steam gauges, I mean, by the instrumentation in the cockpit were the old style gauges. And they had some navigation screens that were glass. In the C-130J, everything is electronic. The heads up display, uh, glass cockpit across the board, and everything is digital and automated. In the H model, uh, when you configure the aircraft with the gear up and you put the flap handle greater than 70 degrees, 70 percent, in, in normal flight, you'll get an oral warning says landing gear, landing gear. Then that's telling you your landing gear is not down and your flaps are more than they should be. In the H model, there's a circuit breaker they pull and it stops that, that person from speaking. So as they're doing flying around, they just pull the breaker as part of their checklist. They do their drop, they come back out, they get the flaps 50 and they push the breaker back in for, for landing. On the C-130J, it's automated or at least it used to be automated. Let's say it is automated, but we couldn't, there was no breaker to pull to stop that person from talking. So this video was my attempt to force the issue with US Air Force headquarters, Lockheed Martin and the Air National Guard into coming up with a fix to make the aircraft stop saying landing gear. So you're gonna hear landing gear through these video. And this is this particular video was the first, first time that we shot GoPro video, so it's a little bit rudimentary. I, I configured my own personal GoPro. I wired, <laughs> I, I came up with a wiring to connect into the C-130J intercom system and my headset and the GoPro to be able to record the audio. It wasn't, wasn't authorized then uh, to get the audio so I could prove to the Air Force how badly we needed to stop this thing from saying landing gear. The problem was when I showed the video Public Affairs was there, and they said, we got to have more of that video. So it ended up becoming a public affairs thing. So the reason we have this video is because you'll hear it, landing gear, but the reason that, that there's so many of them is because of public affairs. Landing gear. There it is there. Landing gear. This is the rock fire. This is north of Santa Maria. And this is an example of me being too close to the lead plane pilot. See, this is the lead plane guy right here. He's flying too slow. And I keep telling him to push it up, speed up, and he doesn't do it. And I get really close to him in the video. Ending gear. Unless you unless you know, you'll see. But you'll also see how close to the ground we get. Ending gear. Land. Ending gear. Land. And I intentionally muted some of the expletives. There you go. <laughs> he is probably 300 feet in front of me. And it's shaking, and that shaking is the retardant coming out of the back of the aircraft, shaking the whole aircraft. So now we're climbing away and reconfiguring the aircraft. Next video is Papoose Fire. This is... We're halfway between Durango, Colorado, and Colorado Springs. We're dropping at about 11,000 feet. Give me two uh, flaps to 70. Landing gear. We want 40. Landing gear. 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 
You'll see some cabins on the left, which we saved. Landing gear. You'll also see a tremendous amount of dead Landing trees, gear. and those are all beetle killed. Landing gear. The wind's right to the left. Landing gear. You can hear the landing gear? It's how irritating landing that is. Gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. We end up tuning that out. Landing gear. 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 We we saved those cabins. Landing gear. Landing gear. Ready, ready, landing gear. Drop. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. All those trees are dead. Landing gear. Beetle kill. Landing gear. That's a look clear. View back from the leaf that leaf plane. That's the retardant I just dropped. Here, Archer. Thousand to go. Okay, I'm gonna climb up. Great guide. Check altitude. All right, I'm going to go to a mass. I'm going to keep this as a, the American fire. This is hey, on the east of Sacramento. Sure. You can see how the visibility has changed in this particular fire. It's late in the evening, late in the afternoon, probably our last drop. What happened on this one to me, and what I use it as a training experience, was that as you're out there flying, you become comfortable with your altitude. When I dispensed retardant, I was about 50 feet off the ground. Landing That's gear. way too low. Wings, wingspan is 134 feet. So I was uh, less than oh, just about a third of the wingspan to the ground. I was in ground effect. <coughs> it made a nice orange line, very thick, but it was it was okay, the main call dangerous. Just, uh, left wing here, or beam it. That's what that line right alongside of it. And just the approach it left to be a third point. Very good. This is what the guys right now are dealing with up in Northern California, this kind of weather and the fire everywhere. So the dialogue is in, internal and outside. You're hearing the, the conversation I'm having with my crew and me talking to the lead plane pilot. And third to a final, keep it one thirty. Sure. Landing gear. The text track is landing gear. Landing gear. Sure. I guess the exit was a little obscure, but uh, as you as you penetrate it, it opens up nicely. Landing gear. You lie. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. So we're gonna cross this ridge about fifty feet. Good line. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Right, there you go. Landing gear. Those trees are about ready. altitude too low. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. I always like to hear that. Uh, that four. Yeah, exactly. Landing gear. Not this one, let's see. This is the infamous rim fire. I have several videos of this fire. I'm going to show you this one because it has a pretty nice flame length, I think. I can only have you one drop. If I get you for another, I'm going to take you. If not, then that's the flame ghost. I've got to return for I'll tell you later. I didn't want, I had a system malfunction I didn't want to have on the on the audio track. I want to get your glasses. Landing gear. 
You're going to have the power lines out there, so just, you know, pop up a little bit. Landing gear. Your right and go straight out, okay? Landing then, gear. Uh, climb up as you get out of the FTA. Landing gear. Got it. We're going to cross Highway 120. Landing gear. 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 Ready. Ready. Altitude. Landing gear. This is Highway 120 right here. Let's see. A, a, so I don't want to bore you too much. This one is uh, Southern California. I'll speed it up here. I-15 is right over here. That's I-15. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Ready. Flat terrain. Terrain. Ready. Terrain. Yep. Because that was so steep, I got so fast. Co pilot just raised the flaps. Okay, take a look. Very good. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. There's leaf line peeling off. Landing gear. said find a, a dust. There's a dozer dust. Dozer dust. Landing gear. Ready. Landing gear. Drop. Landing gear. You see the nose of the track? Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. All right, and then this is a, uh, this video is a, one of the, one of the last videos. This is a famous video that I shot on the rim fire. And it went all around the world. It, uh, from, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, CNN, Al Jazeera, Sky News was everywhere. Uh, Yosemite proper valleys over here. Hetch Hetchy is over here. They've used this for training videos and things. This is me coming in. We're going to turn right. And then we're going to come on final. What's impressive is this. This is the rim fire. Landing gear. 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 That landing gear no longer stays. Landing gear. We, we came up, it's a long story, but we came up with a fix. Straight on your end, it'll go Landing gear. Your it became a button press. Landing to gear. To turn it off. Landing gear. No worries. So I'm flying below an air tanker and above a helicopter. Landing gear. He is right there, Landing lately. gear. Landing 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 gear. Okay. Landing gear. Ready. Ready. Landing gear. Landing gear. He thought I was on the left, but because of this gear. is burning, it's sucking it in there. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. Landing gear. This is all burned. 
Little more speed, all right. Slap tracking up. All right, 100 as you come off there, be on encryption. Uh, now six, be on the lookout for Tinker 100 as you come around the corner. So I got Tinker above me and his helicopter's below me. Slap tracking up. That's the other air tanker talking. Hey, Mass 6 air tank, okay, you got 780 off here at 2 o'clock. Got him, thank you. So I'm staying low because those guys are high and I'm keep, I'm turning away from them. We have TCAS that shows uh, where these aircraft are so I can avoid it as well. And last video, this is us, what it looks like inside. See if I can come up to the latter part here. If you can see the propellers. Mute some excellent expletives. You kind of get the idea of what we do. Heads up displays. Right over that oak tree. It's hard to say. It's hard to stay slow. And I'm dropping right now. It's a pretty benign. I'm looking through the heads up display, looking at terrain, looking at, at the lead plane pilot. Add the power, he brings the, flat, the flaps up, and that's what it looks like. All right, now how do I get back to here? Stop. All right. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Uh, well, <laughs> I have a question. So, uh, Brian, this is unbelievable. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I have a question. So the crew is it's you. Uh, it's the two pilots and then Loadmaster. Is that correct? Well, it depends upon the airplane. So the C-130H have two pilots, a flight engineer, a navigator, and two loadmasters. Okay. C-130J, two pilots, two loadmasters because of the advanced uh, navigation system. Uh, the J's are really, really nice air, uh, tactical air lift aircraft. It, electric checklists, it heals itself in a lot of cases, shuts bleed air, does a lot of things that the, the engineer would have done. So <clears throat> it also increases the workload. So we had to change some of the crew coordination items uh, in the J model that the H guys can do. You know, the co-pilot has got a lot more to do communications wires of the ground where they would offload that to the navigator in the H model. Nice. Uh, so uh, question uh, from the chat, uh, what, uh, if you have to fly ab above a fire, what's the safe altitude to fly? Well, <clears throat> it depends because if the plume is, is full of um, uh, gases and debris. I've seen floating limbs, I mean limbs, you know, three and four inch limbs at 2,000 feet as they're being pushed up in the in the uh, the fire cloud. And some clouds can generate their own weather, including lightning. <clears throat> so you stay away from them if, if you can. Uh, a fire itself, um, the, the flames, it depends on the flame length. Uh, you just have to stay away from them, stay on top of them. Um, it's all visual. As long as you're typically above them visually, you're okay. If it's smoke, it, you're, you're, we say generally 10,000 feet or so uh, is most of the gases are all burned off. I'll take that garbage. Out. Remember that's ash and debris in there. Yeah. I'm still on that. Because he was showing a lot of videos. Jerry, shoot. <laughs> I got the high sign for my wife too. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, uh, some, of, some of the participants saw uh, the video looked a little bit choppy. I know that it, it looks okay to me. Um, so some of these videos are on YouTube. Um, and the YouTube videos, uh, I didn't post a link or anything in here, but if you, if you look at, if you search MAFS 
six. I'll put bags in there in the morning. Rimfire, math six rimfire. You see, the gardener takes this stuff. Oh, hell, this okay. doesn't even uh, need to be empty. Uh, this uh, one, uh, <laughs> one third on. full. This one, no, needs to go. Hey. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, my host power is there. Exactly. Um, M A F F M A F F S six rim fire, and then you, you'll see my name, Brian Allen. Uh, that's the one you want with my name on it, and you'll see uh, most of these. Some of these videos, you won't see them all because I didn't post them all. But uh, you'll see some of these videos out there, and they have them full length. All right. Um, if uh, if if you want, I will be sending a. I will be sending um, uh, uh, updates to the uh, all the attendees uh, after afterwards. So if you want to send me a link, I can sure. I can include that in the uh, in the in the uh, summary. Sure. It looks like Jerry wants to be unmuted. Yes, I did. Okay. Oh, I thought I did. Let me try again. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. This is fantastic. <laughs> I wish yes, we had a larger you. number, but I think the word is going to get around. So uh, we have the recording and everything. So, oh yeah, oh okay. yeah. Uh, thank you. So thank we got you. So, much. You. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was all the questions. Uh, are there any uh, yeah. any closing words, Jerry? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Brian, I owe you lunch. We could pick a date and time and wherever you want to go. You I like that too. Uh, no, it was wonderful. We really appreciate it. I know that uh, even though there were a uh, few attendees, they hung in there. And that's fantastic. <laughs> true. And your, your video was just marvelous. So. Yeah, well, that, that video was fantastic. Oh, great. I'm, it's my uh, fault. And, and frightening. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. You don't do that when you fly with the airlines, I assume. No, of course not. We do not spill their drinks. No. Yeah, exactly. It's my pleasure. It really is, and I, I and I like talking about the stuff. It was my life for years, and and I'm I'm glad they're still out doing it and doing it safely. We did lose uh, one aircraft, MAF seven, uh, and um, a couple of friends of mine killed in that aircraft, and so it is a it is a uniquely risky operation, and so I think about those guys every day and. And the guys, and my, my son is a loadmaster, a C-130 loadmaster, and he's maths, he's actually an evaluator loadmaster and a maths instructor loadmaster in maths instructor loadmaster. So uh, he's out there um, on these missions. He's already, already been flying the season, and uh, I'm thankful he's out there, but I'm also uh, cognizant of the risks that he's in, he faces as well. So Are these considered air mail? Category it used to be, uh, and now they're, um, they're aerial achievement medals after 15 drops. Uh, you get an aerial achievement medal. It used to be aerial, aerial medals because of the risk. But yeah. the problem is, how do you, what, what's the metric by which you judge? And so they, we came down to 15 drops and as being an aerial achievement. And I have 16, I think, credited air medal, air, aerial achievement medals in this regard. But uh, those are the ones that didn't count all the time before we were counting them. So uh, well, that's a shame. We, yeah, we get, I have thirteen. They're not every <laughs> <Yeah. but> year. <laughs> they're insanity medals. Yeah. Not that we're you're competing <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, I think no. we can close this out. And again, thank you very much. And let's be in touch. I sent you an email about the, uh, uh, you know, when the when the J model came in. So sometime we can talk about that. Okay, Jerry. My All right. pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. And, and that <laughs> offer on lunch is still good, by the way. I like that idea. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank, thank you, everybody, and have a nice evening. <laughs>